Bond character is somewhere between that of a, uh, of a single bond and that of a double bond. In fact, it's sort of about 30% double bond and 70% single bond that make up this picture. So as a result, you have slow rotation about this bond. I'll say slow, which means if I put a star next to this ethyl group here, I'll just put sort of a, a star here to remind us it's special, you do have a dynamic equilibrium where you swap positions, right? So in this case, the starred ethyl group is cis to the carbonyl. In this case, the starred ethyl group is trans to the carbonyl. But this equilibrium is slow on what we'll say the NMR time scale. And what I really want to do in today's talk is to give us more of a feeling of what's slow, what's fast, both in time and also in energy. So when I say this is about 30% double bond character, I want you to get a feeling for what that means in kilocalories per mole and how I know that number. And then I also want us to get a feeling for what happens as we cross from the slow regime to the fast regime. So we'll get sort of one equation, a couple of calibration points on energy and time out of, out of today's talk. Now, if, if you think about this, let's take a simpler situation. The case that people invariably use for didactic purposes is something with singlets. So the case that sort of was the classic was dimethylformamide just because it's easy to, easy to think about and easy, easy to, to simulate. So here with methyl groups, of course, you have singlets. And just like the ethyl groups where one of them is more downfield, the one that's cis to the carbonyl is more downfield, the one that's trans from the carbonyl is more upfield, you have the same with the methyl groups here. And I just want to, we'll call these HA and HB. And so you have some equilibrium here. We can call this Ka and Kb. In the case of a perfectly symmetrical molecule, the rate constant's going to be the same. But if these were two groups, say, of disparate size, like a tert-butyl group and a methyl group, then the rate one way would be faster than the other because you would have an equilibrium constant that wasn't one. In other words, you'd have an equilibrium constant where if you had a bulkier group, say the bulkier group would spend more time here and the less bulky group would spend more time here or vice versa. All right, so let's just imagine a little thought experiment for this situation. So the situation we just saw was one where you have two singlets. So this is just my old drawing of an H1 NMR spectrum. And at some condition where you're slow, you're going to see two sets of peaks. For the same window, if it were very fast, you'd see one peak. And I'm just drawing the same spectral window and sort of plotting this out. So I guess I'll kind of put these, put these on, this, on the scale, on the same scale. And so we could say this is fast. And of course, what's the best way to take something that's slow and make it fast in the laboratory? Yeah. Heat it up. So this is cold, and this is hot. All right, somewhere between that point of cold and hot, you hit a middle point, which is called medium. <laughs> yep, medium, OK. You hit a middle point, medium, where you're at what's called coalescence. Now, at coalescence, what's happening is each of these peaks is getting broader and broader 
until they merge. This is the uncertainty principle at work. Remember we talked about line width and I said that if you were able to measure the velocity for infinitely long, in other words, if there were never any spin flip, any relaxation, any swapping of population between alpha and beta states, your lines would be infinitely sharp. But I said when we were talking about the uncertainty principle, your lines are typically about a hertz wide or a little less than a hertz wide because your relaxation time is on the order of a couple of seconds. In other words, you cannot get your lines infinitely sharp because you're only literally measuring the velocity for a finite amount of time. As you heat things up, what's happening is you're flipping faster and faster and so your lines are broadening out. So what's really happening at coalescence so let's just go back to the equation I presented for, by the uncertainty principle. Which is, if you look at your line, in theory there's some exact position of the line. In other words, in theory, if you could make that measurement infinitely, your line would have this position. But what you're getting is signal out here because you're not measuring that line with infinite time, you're not able to because of relaxation. And so you have a certain width, and that's the value when we talked about the uncertainty principle we call delta nu, right? Delta nu basically is the half line width at half height. In other words, it is the level where you're sort of within these error bars, so you're plus or minus delta nu of that theoretical central value. And we said from the uncertainty principle, delta nu times the time, that's the lifetime. It's not really a half-life. It's almost like a half-life. It's an eth life, you know, 1 over 2.3 instead of 1 over 2.0. Delta nu times time is equal to 1 over root 2 pi. In other words, if you're able to make that measurement for a second, then delta nu is going to be 0.22 hertz, or the line width at half height, the full line width is going to be 0.44 hertz. If, on the other hand, you're only able to have that lifetime be, say, a tenth of a second, so I'll say t equals 0.1 sec, now we get to delta nu is equal to 2.2 hertz. In other words, now that line has become 4.4 hertz wide at half height. So what you were really seeing at coalescence When I have this sketch of this broadened hump like this, what you're really seeing is two fat Lorentzians that are adding up underneath there. So let me make this sort of with dotted lines to show a fat Lorentzian. Like so. And if the separation of the lines here, right, if this separation here, if we call this delta nu lines, for want of a better term, in other words, the separation of the lines in hertz, at this point, at coalescence, then now each of these lines is fattened out so that it's delta nu, not the delta nu of lines, but this, this distance here, this delta nu is now, so if this is what we call delta nu of lines, that this delta nu is now half of the delta nu of lines. Does that make sense? In other words, each of the lines is broadened out 
so that its half width at half height is halfway across. And that is when your lines are going to be coalesced, where you're no longer going to see a distinct line on the left, line on the right. If they're broadened anymore, they're going to be merged together. And eventually, you just have a single, single peak, and you're at this situation here. But right now, when they're broadened out, they're broadened out to a point where, where they have merged together. And so at that point, delta nu of the lines, the separation of the lines, times tau, which is now going to be our lifetime at coalescence, is equal to 2 over root 2 pi. Right, this is just the equation that we have over there, except now because we have the difference, each of these is fattened out halfway. If we have two of them, it's going to now be 2. And so what this boils down to then is a simple equation that tau, when you just work this out, is equal to 0 0.450 over the delta nu of the lines. In other words, the lifetime at coalescence is equal to 0 0.450 divided by the separation of the lines at a lower temperature. Does that make sense? The 0.54 is simply what happens if I take in my calculator 2 divided by root 2 divided by 3.1415. And then I put that in the numerator and put the delta nu lines in the denominator. Is that, is that exactly 2 or maybe 2.1 or maybe 2.1? Well, you mean the 2? Oh, well, I'm saying because here our delta nu is half of the separation of the Within what you can measure, it's exactly half. Let me show you, maybe the best way is for me to show you how things look as you vary here. So basically, if you go any, coming to, if it was more, you'd start to pull in, and you'd start to pull together. If it's less, you'll see a dimple in the middle. And let me show you what this, what this can best be, be pictured as. And this is just a simulation. This is from a chapter on dynamic NMR spectroscopy um, in a book. Um, let's see, which book? This may be a book on dynamic NMR spectroscopy. So this is an old, just an old drawing of a simulation of what you would expect. And it's really based on dimethylformamid, and it's actually probably based on like DMF on a on a 60 megahertz spectrometer or something like this. So their simulation is as follows. And the reason I say it's a 60 megahertz spectrometer is the lines in this simulation are delta nu lines is equal to 20 hertz. In other words, at a 60 megahertz NMR spectrometer, that would be about 3 tenths of a ppm, which is pretty reasonable. Now on a 500 megahertz spectrometer, that would be 0.04 ppm. So anyway, for their little simulation, they're saying, imagine that you have two lines, those two singlets, and they're separated by 20 hertz. And imagine that you have a T2, that's a relaxation time, of 0.5 seconds. In other words, imagine that the native lifetime for this molecule due to relaxation was half a second. In other words, that your lines are now about 0.9 hertz width, full width at half height. Not half width, but full, full width at half height. And so that's how your normal spectrum would look. 
Now, imagine that you start to heat this sample up so that you have rotation between the two. So you have the two flipping back and forth. So imagine here, for example, that K for you know, our equilibrium, this is our like dimethylformamid spectrum, where we can call this A and B or star. Imagine now that our rate constant, oh, yeah, yeah. Imagine that our rate constant was 5.0 per second. If your rate constant is 5 per second, then your lifetime is 1 over k, right? So your lifetime at this point is 200 milliseconds. It's 0.2 seconds, right? And so your lines have now, because they're not staying in the cis or trans state as long. You can think of this as we started, here we're cold, and here we're starting to heat the sample up. Here, here they actually have a very slow K. K is equal to, in this case, um, 0.1 per second. In other words, it's a 10 second lifetime. They're not swapping at any appreciable rate. As you heat up the sample in this simulation, they go to K equals five, K equals 10, per second, so your lifetime is now 0.1 seconds. And finally, you get to a point, and you notice, so here you are, and now your line width is still less than half the distance between them. So you still see this dimple here. This is it. And now, you can kind of see, right at this point now, it, it, they are coalesced together. So right at k is equal to 44.4 per second, they are now coalesced together. And then as you heat the sample up more, as you get hotter and hotter, as you get faster and faster, now we get to k equals 100. So now your lifetime is 10 milliseconds. And then you get to k equals 500. So your lifetime is now 2 milliseconds. And finally, you get to k equals 10,000. So now your lifetime is a tenth of a millisecond. That's a relaxation time. That's your native line width. So what they're saying, of course, is all lines have a native line width. Let us pretend that we had a native line width of about a hertz. So is P1 irrelevant? You could just as well have it be T1. Either T1 or T2 is going to contribute to line width. I don't know why they chose T2. It's, it's, completely, it's completely arbitrary because whether your magnetization is spreading out in the XY plane so you're no longer able to get signal or your magnetization is returning to the Z axis, you still have line width. In the case of small molecules, typically T1 is the predominant relaxation pathway. In the case of very large, so strychnine for example, in the case of very large molecules like proteins, T2 is the predominant relaxation mechanism. And this depends in part on how fast the molecules tumble and how viscous the solvent is. Other thoughts and questions? So, so when you say at coalescence, it means that the people just, just disappear. Just so it's like a flat. It's flat, yeah. It's basically, this is, right, this is perfect coalescence.
All right, so this is, this is um, simulated data for sort of a textbook example. And now, now what I want to do is show you a, a real example, show you how to get, um, get a um, rate out of this, and then we're going to translate that into a free energy of activation. So, okay. So the case, the case that I'll show you, which is, which is kind of cool, this is just one I pulled from, from my own, own experience. And it's a sort of neat molecule because we're going to see that there's actually two different things going on here. So the molecule is Ortho, uh, diethyl orthotoluamide. And I'll show you the spectrum of it here. I have another handout for you. You know, one of the great things about being in graduate school is a lot of times you get to observe stuff that's cool and beautiful and relates to your classes. And this just happened to be something I, I noted when back actually when I was in graduate school. And it's like, oh, this is cool. I'll keep this as an example. And it was just something I was doing on a synthetic methods project, just working out a method. So the, um, so I had my, my sample of diethyl um, toluamide, diethyl orthal toluamide, and I started to warm it up. I, I noticed, I was curious because there was some broadness to the peaks here. So you had your two ethyl peaks. This is your methyl peak, right? So these are your, these are your CH2s. These are your CH3s. And I was just curious about what was going on. So this was a sample in DMSO D6. DMSO has a very high boiling point, so you can heat it up to a high temperature. Deuterochloroform boils at 60, I think 66 degrees. So if you were to try to heat it up to 160 in an NMR tube, the NMR tube would, at, if you're lucky, just blow the top off the tube. If you're not lucky, explode in the probe. Either way, you'd have a very very angry department at you because you would trash the NMR spectrometer and do serious damage. So as you warm it up, the CH2s coalesce. And 110 is really perfect for the coalescence temperature of the CH2s. Now, the CH2s are pretty far apart. The CH2s are at, this one's at 3.45. This is a 300 megahertz NMR spectrometer, and the other one is at 3.03. .03. The methyls are a little closer together, so they're delta nu lines. The separation of the lines is smaller, so they actually will coalesce even with slower rotation. So the further you are apart, the faster you have to spin in order to have the two lines coalesce into one. If two lines are very close together, you only have to spin it slowly, only have to have rotation slowly to get coalescence. If two lines are very far apart, you have to have rotation very quickly. So we're already coalesced. I'll write coalesced here to indicate that it's, that it's in the past tense. And here, at 100 degrees, we're not yet coalesced. So somewhere here, at about 105, I would say, would have been, would have been coalescence if I had bothered to done that, do that experiment. But let's, for a moment, focus <coughs> on these two methyls. And I want us to figure out the rate here. And then we're going to translate that rate into an energy. So for the CH2s, 
the delta nu lines, the separation of the lines, is equal to 3.45 minus 3.03 .03 times, it's a 300 megahertz spectrometer, so that's 126 hertz. So now literally it's plug and chug in this equation. Tau, the lifetime at coalescence, which is 110 degrees for this particular set of resonances, the lifetime at coalescence is just equal to 0 0.450 divided by 126, which is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. I didn't measure it at, at 105, but I think it's about 105 is the coalescence temperature. So for the CH3s, the CH3s were separated by 60 hertz. And so in that case, tau, so the lifetime at their coalescence, hundred and five degrees for them, let's say, is going to be about seven point five times ten to the negative three seconds. In other words, about seven point five milliseconds. To put it to put it in terms of that other example, at room temperature, rotation about this amid bond is slow on the NMR time scale. In other words, it's on the order of let's say seconds or hundreds of milliseconds. So we see one ethyl peak, we see another ethyl peak. As we warm it up, it rotates faster and faster and faster as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. By 105 degrees, it's spinning around with a lifetime of 7.5 milliseconds. The methyls being close together have coalesced. And we heat it up a little more to 110 degrees, the methylenes being further apart. Now it have it spinning at 3.6 millisecond lifetime. The methylenes have coalesced. And then by the time I heat it up to 150 or 160, the peaks are now relatively sharp. And usually by that point, it's pretty hard to get good shims. So we probably would see a quartet and a triplet there if I could shim the spectrometer better. All right, I want to translate this lifetime into a free energy. So, so one of the take home messages here from this example is Below a millisecond, let's say, is fast on the NMR time scale. And you know, above uh, 10 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds is slow on the NMR time scale. Let's now see how that relates to free energy of activation. So what I want to do is translate our K to delta G double dagger. And one can, from transition state theory, you have the I-ring equation, which basically deals with the amount, deals with a Boltzmann population of molecules that are able to cross an energy barrier. And the I-ring equation is that the rate constant is equal to kappa, which is the transmission coefficient. which is generally taken as 1 times uh, the Boltzmann constant times the temperature over Planck's constant times e to the negative delta g double dagger over rt, where you have the gas constant and the temperature. 
what this is, the, the way the Eyring equation is derived is basically you're setting up an equilibrium between molecules in the ground state and molecules in the transition state and then assuming that half the molecules go over the transition state at that point. And of course, of course, K here at coalescence, K is equal to 1 over tau. So we're going to use our 110 degrees. K is equal to 1 over tau, 1 over our lifetime. So what I want to do is figure out our free energy here. So at 110 degrees Celsius, if I now just plug into this thing, I get 1 over 3.6 times 10 to the negative 3 is equal to 1.35 times 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the negative 23rd. And at 110, we're at 383 Kelvin. We divide by Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th. And for, for the sake of taking on our math for a moment, I'll just keep this as e to the negative delta G, delta G double dagger over RT. All right, if I just continue to work through my equation, I get 3.484 times 10 to the negative 11th equals e to the negative delta g double dagger over rt. And if I work through, that's, um, that's uh, delta g double dagger is equal to negative 1.987 times 10 to the negative third times 383 times the natural log of 3.484 times 10 to the negative 11th. And when all is said and done, the number I get is 18.3 kilocalorie per mole. All right, so what is that saying? That's saying, coming back to this point I raised at the beginning of class, what's the degree of double bond character in an amide? Well, you've got an 18 kilocalorie per mole barrier to rotation. If that were a single bond, you'd have essentially no barrier to rotation. If that were a pi bond, you could say, oh, that'd be maybe you know, 60, 70 kilocalories per mole. In other words, like in ethylene, the pi bond is you know, 60, 65 kilocalories per mole. So I look at that and say, oh, that's about 30 percent, 25, 30 percent of a pi bond. In other words, if I had ethylene, well, if I had, if I had cis-2-butene, no matter how hot I heated it in the NMR spectrometer, I'd never see isomerization between cis and trans-2-butene. The energy barrier to rotate about a real pi bond is so high, you just don't get that from thermal energy. But with this partial pi bond, I have about an 18 kilocalorie per mole barrier. All right, there's something else that's really cool that's embedded in this, in this spectrum. So take a look, take a look at the spectrum at 30 degrees Celsius. And you'll notice, even at this point, one of our methylenes is a little broad. You see that? There's actually, this is a cool molecule. There are actually two dynamic processes that are going on here. And so I, I figured at the time I was just curious, but now of course I'm using this as an example. And it's a fun example because it actually ties into some cool concepts in stereochemistry. So 
anyway, I figured I'd want to cool the sample down and take a look at it. Now, DMSO freezes just a little below room temperature, so you can't do super high temperature NMR in chloroform. You can't do super low temperature NMR in DMSO. There are chlorinated solvents you can use, like 1122-dichloroethane uh, can go up to very high temperatures and down to very low temperatures, but DMSO is common, so I use that. And chloroform is common. You could use methylene chloride if you needed to go to a lower temperature. So I took the NMR spectrum in chloroform to see what the heck was going on. And it's really, really beautiful. So, so at room temperature, which happened to be that day, 22 Celsius, now we were just not quite almost at coalescence. And you notice, as you cool it down, now we're neg at 10 degrees, while well, my Xerox didn't come out well. By the time you're at zero degrees, you notice that CH2 is resolving itself into two sets of peaks. And by the time you've gone down to negative 40, you can see these. These happen to be doublet of quartets. And by the time you're down to negative 40 degrees Celsius, you can see that even, even the other methylene, which started as a quartet, now has a more complex splitting pattern. So this is, this is really kind of cool. So there's a second dynamic process with a coalescence temperature that's just a hair above 22 in chloroform. Remember, it's a different solvent, so you have slightly different rate constants. So we'll, we'll say that I didn't measure it exactly, but we'll say that coalescence is probably at about 25 in chloroform. Two ninety-eight Kelvin. So, so what I want to do now is to play with this process, figure out what's going on, and then look at look at the energies that are involved and get us get us calibrated on energy. All right. So this system happens to be way cool. So because you have these two substituents and the methyl group, your methyl group is not going to be coplanar. In other words, You have a situation where the toluamid ring is rotated out of planarity from the, meth from the, the amide group. They are orthogonal or close to orthogonal to each other. And this is a situation where you have what's called axial chirality. Stereochemistry is cool. It's the same thing you have in allene. If you have 1,3-dimethyl allene, there are two enantiomers of, that, of it. So if you have simplest example you can come up with. This molecule is chiral. All right, so we have an equilibrium here of two atrope isomeric rotomers.
And these two atrope isomeric rotamers are enantiomers. which means your CH2s are diastereotopic. Now the CH2 that's next to the carbonyl has very little magnetic anisotropy. So you see that at very low temperature you do see something that's other than a simple quartet. But this one the two protons, the pro-R and the pro-S, have a high degree of magnetic anisotropy for the, the one that's, that's on the same side as the ring. And so we actually have separation there. And in this case, the delta nu, as I cooled it down, remember we could see the two, two different lines here. And so here, one of these lines is at 3.94. And the other line is at 3.30. And so the delta nu lines then is going to now be for those two, two lines for the methylenes, it's going to be 3.94 minus 3.30 times 300 is 192 hertz. And so our tau, the, the lifetime at coalescence, is 0 0.450. And that's uh, divided by 192, is 2.3 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds at, I don't know if it's 298 or 295k. I said. I don't know. I, I, it's, that's close to coalescence. If it's at 295K, I plug in delta G double dagger is equal to, to 13.7 kilocalories per mole. All right, so take a minute to think about this. We've got two processes in this molecule. One that's almost invisible at room temperature because, well, that's invisible slightly above room temperature, which is the rotation about this bond. And the other, that is the rotation about this bond. The rotation about this bond has an 18 kilocalorie per mole, 18 point, what did I say, 3 kilocalorie per mole barrier. So it doesn't become fast until you heat the thing up hot, like 110 degrees or 105 degrees. The rotation about this bond is eh, kind of medium scale at room temperature. You cool it down, it becomes slow. You heat it up, it becomes fast and is invisible. So that's kind of cool. Now I want to give you one caveat because every, every student, I hate to say student, every, every new person's um, first excuse when they see something in the NMR that they don't understand where they see two, two sets of peaks is a hindered rotation. All right, I'm going to make a very sweeping generalization. The hindered rotations that you see are only going to involve things where you have an sp2 atom connected to an sp2 atom. Chances are, if it's an sp2 atom connected to an sp3 atom or an sp3 atom to an sp3 atom, it's going to be fast. So hindered rotation generally only for sp2 to sp2. So here we have an sp2 hybridized benzene connected to an sp2 hybridized carbonyl. When you have some extra steric hindrance, it's slow to rotate. Here you have an sp2 connected with partial double bond character. You have slow rotation. It's, it's pretty darn flat. It's actually, that nitrogen really is sp2. 
what I, what I mean specifically is I can think of no simple bonding situation where you have sp3 atoms connected, single sp3 atoms, where anything is slow without some sp2 intervention. Cyclohexane ring flip, yeah. where you have two sets of eclipsing, 10 kilocalories per mole, which is still fast on the NMR time scale at room temperature. Cyclohexane, though, they're coupled together. That one, if you cool to negative, seven, negative 80 degrees, does become, can become slow. Actually, let me use this as a chance. Did that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Or? Um, so, so I guess, um, yeah, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. How, how did metal go change? What? You rotate, you spin. So basically, the benzene ring is like this here with the methyl group pointing out, and it spins back and forth. But it has to bang. In doing so, the methyl group has to bang past the carbonyl. And there's enough steric hindrance there that it can't do it rapidly. Um, it's OK. It's not going to be perfectly perpendicular. It'll be at about. Uh, about a 60 degree angle, and it'll nicely rock back and forth. But to cross to the other iotrope isomer, that's where it's hard. If you want to make a model of it, this is a great one to use pi mole. You can easily make a model in pi mole, and you'll see how they, they sit and how they bang into it. It'll put it, you still have axial chirality. As long as you have a barrier, Oh, did I? Oh, wait a second. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh. Thank you. Yes. No, I meant to, I meant to have this going back. Yeah. There, there you go. That may. OK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, methyl back, methyl forward. They're two enantiomers, that will. Yeah, yeah. So what? Two in it. So, okay. My thumb's the methyl group. Methyl out, flip, <coughs> methyl back, rotate, methyl back. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I want to show you my, the last thing I want to do is give you two take home messages. And let me start with the message. And then, then I'll go, um, then I'll show you my thought on this. All right. My thought is, the take home message is, is the NMR time scale, you know, I like to have simple things in my, in my mind as ways to keep things, is um, let's say less than one millisecond is fast. About one to 10 milliseconds is intermediate. And greater than 10 milliseconds is slow. These are obviously sweeping generalizations because they're going to depend on separation of lines and they're going to depend on field strength of the spectrometer. But let me show you my, my thinking on this. If we imagine a delta nu of lines and it's 50 hertz, I'm going to give us two scenarios. Let's start with a scenario where we're 50 hertz. And let's say what that is in ppm at 500. I'll just take 500 megahertz because that's sort of a typical modern spectrometer. So that's going to be 0.1 ppm. So you see two lines at, P, at 0.1 ppm separation. And the tau, the lifetime at coalescence, is 0.00 nine seconds. In other words, it's uh, 10 milliseconds, or k is equal to 111 per second. So in other words, with two lines that are close together, if your process is occurring on the order of one millisecond, it's going to be fast. If it's occurring on the order of 100 milliseconds, it's slow. If our separation of lines was 500 hertz, that's pretty far apart. That's 1 ppm. But we saw half a ppm over in that example. If it's 1 ppm, the lifetime at coalescence 
would be 0 0.009 seconds, in other words, 111, uh, 1,111 per second. In other words, if the lines are further apart, if it's spinning around you know, many times per millisecond, it's fast. If it's spinning around once every 10 milliseconds, it's slow. So that's how I, I sort of calibrate myself. Let me give you my other calibration that I like to keep, keep in my head. So the other calibration I like to keep in my head is typical NMR energies. is going to be, say, 10 to 20 kilocalories per mole. In other words, a process that's 15 kilocalories per mole kind of teeters between slow and fast at room temperature. A process that's 20 kilocalories per mole is slow at room temperature, but it's going to be fast at a very hot temperature. A process that's 10 kilocalories per mole will be slow at very low temperature, but fast at room temperature. And so let me, let me just show you my thinking on this. So if I take, if I go ahead and look at 1 over k, and I'm just going to make a little table of 1 over k in seconds as a function of delta G double dagger and temperature. And so, I mean, this is me windowing myself. There's your take home message on top, but let me show you, show you my windowing myself. So imagine we consider energies of 10, 15, 20, and 25 kilocalorie per mole delta G double dagger. And then we consider from the, the um, from a rate equation, we consider temperatures, and I'm just going to window at three temperatures, negative 50 degrees C, which is kind of cold, 298K, 25C, which is kind of room temperature, and 373K, 100C, which is kind of hot. All right, and then if I simply calculate from the uh, calculate the rate that applies, the lifetime in seconds is one millisecond for a process with a 10 kilocalorie barrier at negative 50. That process has a lifetime of 3.5 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds at room temperature and 9.3 times 10 to the negative eighth seconds at high temperature. In other words, for a 10 kilocalorie barrier process, at negative 50, we teeter between slow and fast. So that's sort of our intermediate, our coalescence temperature. By this point, we're fast. And by this point, we're very fast. So 10 kilocalorie barrier, cyclohexane ring flip, slow when cold. OK, if we go to 15, 108 seconds is the lifetime at negative 50. In other words, it's slow at negative 50. But that 15 kilocalorie barrier process becomes milliseconds, 16 milliseconds at room temperature. In other words, 15 kilocalories becomes intermediate at room temperature. That was like that rotation about the benzene bond. And it's fast by the time we're hot. It's 7.9 times 10 to the negative fifth seconds lifetime. 20 kilocalories per mole, 8.6 times 10 to the 6, lifetime that's forever. 75 at room temperature, 75 seconds is slow. But you get to hot, and it's 68 milliseconds. So now we get into the intermediate regime in high temperature. That was like our amid bond rotation. 18.3 kilocalories, we had to heat it up to 110. And finally, by the time we get to 25 kilocalories, 6.9 times 10 to the 11th seconds, 
3.5 times 10 to the fifth seconds and 57 seconds. In other words, by the time we have a 25 kilocalorie per mole barrier, even at high temperature, you are still slow. All right, so that's where I window myself and I say 10 degrees, slow at low temperature, 15 degrees, you know, intermediate, I say intermediate at room temperature, 20 degrees intermediate at high temperature. All right, our midterm will be next time. We have an in-class part on Friday and then an open book part on Saturday, so a closed book part on Friday.